terrible chair. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, we are uh, having a little bit of a late start, so uh, this panel, despite the fact that it does address one of the most complex uh, issues in the whole world, is going to last a little shorter. I had a long, uh, I prepared a long introduction, but since I am probably the, ne the least knowledgeable person on the stage about the issue, uh, I'm going to forego the introduction that, uh, that I prepared. I'm just going to start out by saying uh, that my closest encounter with, uh, with the Korean issue was at a time when I served as president of the United Nations General Assembly in 2013, when uh, one of the nuclear tests uh, was performed by the North Korea. And, and I was in office, and I very well remember the early morning when this became news. And when I had uh, uh, very agile conversations since early morning with my uh, American colleague, with my South Korean colleague, uh, everybody uh, asked me to, uh, to call for, for a session of the General Assembly, an emergency session. And, and I said, uh, of course, uh, I will do that, uh, but I need to talk to the ambassador of North Korea first. So I invited to my office the ambassador of North Korea, and I asked him, Sir, uh, there are deep concerns about what took place last night uh, in North Korea. And he asked me, what happened? And I said, well, actually, the whole world is talking about this. And there seems to be uh, you know, a, a nuclear test that was performed. And he said, that is not true. Do not believe the propaganda of the West. So I must admit that I was puzzled with this conversation, but uh, nonetheless, we did proceed to hold a session of the General Assembly. But, uh, but that, was my, uh, that was my closest call with, uh, with the issue that uh, has been dominating uh, the agenda of international relations for decades. And especially in the last year, year and a half, uh, there were some turbulent developments from fire and fury and nuclear buttons to uh, to a bunch of smiles and handshakes and uh, and uh, and a very hopeful uh, discourse uh, according to many <clears throat> observers in this particular case but as i said i'm going to stop there i'm not going to speak more about uh, about the about the issue here on the stage we have uh, some really really impressive group of people uh, on my uh, Immediate left is uh, Taskin El Bagdorj, former president of Mongolia and a dear friend of mine, actually a classmate of mine from graduate school. Uh, he, is, uh, he was the leader of the peaceful democratic revolution in Mongolia in 1990s and uh, served as member of parliament, chairman of the major uh, party in Mongolia, as well as prime minister prior to becoming president having served two terms as president. Um, he's a commissioner right now for the International Commission Against the Death Penalty and a patron of the World Sustainable Development Forum, a proud graduate from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, then we have uh, Wang GC, uh, one of China's leading thinkers and uh, most respected intellectuals. He is the professor of the School of International Studies and president of the Institute of International and Strategic Studies at Peking University. Uh, he was a global scholar at Princeton. He's an honorary president of the Chinese Association for American Studies. And um, for many years, uh, he served as a member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Committee of China's Foreign Ministry. Uh, he holds uh, many other uh, he holds many other affiliations, and is also a director of the Institute of International Strategic Studies at the Central Party School of the Communist Party of China. Uh, then we have Douglas 
Powell, Vice President for Studies at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, he previously served as Vice Chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase International, uh, but he was an official U.S. representative to Taiwan as director of the American Institute in, in Taiwan 2006, uh, sorry, 2002 to 2006. Uh, he was in the National Council staffs of Presidents Reagan and uh, George H.W. Bush. Uh, and uh, he uh, also worked uh, in U.S. embassies in Singapore and Beijing. Uh, also a Harvard University graduate. Uh, then uh, we have, well, the, uh, the order is slightly different. I was about to introduce a Russian, but it's definitely not a Russian. Mr. Uh, Yim Sung Jun, uh, Senior Advisor at Lee International IP and Law Group. Previously, he held the <coughs> position of President of the Korea Foundation. Served uh, for many years uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Of South Korea, uh, amongst other posts, he held uh, the position of ambassador to Canada in Egypt, uh, served also as deputy minister of foreign affairs, graduated from uh, Seoul National University, Oxford University, and Keio University. Josue Yuichi is the professor at the Faculty of Law at Keio University in Japan. Uh, previously, he was an assistant professor at Hokkaido University. He was a visiting researcher at Princeton, visiting professor at uh, Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, he's a former member of the advisory board at Japan's National Security Council. Uh, he was part of the Prime Minister's advisory panel on reconstruction of the legal basis, as well as on national security and defense capabilities. And last but not least uh, is uh, Georgi uh, Tolaraya, uh, one of Russia's foremost experts uh, on Korean affairs. Uh, he uh, served uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, of, of Russia, but he also served uh, in uh, Russia's embassies both in the North and in the South Korea. He is uh, currently the Director of Korean Programs at the Institute of Economy at the Russian Academy of Science uh, and um, Professor of Oriental Studies at the Megimo Executive Director of the Russia's National Committee on BRICS Research. Um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to uh, give floor to President uh, Albert Dorge. And I'm going to ask you a question because um, you did visit North Korea more than once, and you were very active as president in uh, inter-Korean dialogue. Uh, gave you, you gave a famous speech in uh, Pyongyang about democracy. Um, it's a fascinating topic to be discussed there. So, Mr. President. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to Terry de Montbral bringing all of us here, and also to the Kingdom of Morocco, our auspicious host. <coughs> and uh, to the topic of North Korea, I had a chance of meeting many people from the North Korean leadership circle, and also professors and security experts, and even defectors from North Korea. Uh, but uh, I thought uh, sometime that uh, change can be done in North Korea. You know, Mongolia has a, had a similar political uh, establishment like in North Korea, and now Mongolia is one of the free and liberal establishment. But uh, this kind of uh, change, as we did in my country, it never going to happen in North Korea in, 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 in the face of this dictatorship. And uh, I am not a believer that uh, North Korean society is going to change and uh, led by, uh, led by uh, their leadership. In, in terms of the North Korean nuclear issue, I think uh, there are three big factors. And the uh, first factor is uh, 
Many people think that the uh, North Korean young leader is only one leader there, but he has a he has a very experienced and tested uh, leaders, uh, elderly leaders team, and uh, they usually say that we made more than ten administrations of America, ten presidents. That's the very experienced team he has. And the second is the uh, second largest economy and power on, 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 his, <coughs> uh, on his backyard. And third, of course, uh, I think uh, North Koreans are, this regime has a great ability to hide things. And I know <coughs> that uh, many people think that uh, North Korea can be rid of the nuke. I'm also not believer in that. If people ask a question, I will answer to that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and, and thank you for being, for being brief. Um, so uh, my next uh, question relates to China. And a lot of people are saying that, uh, Professor Wang, uh, China seemed to be the biggest uh, uh, winner out of the current trajectory if this current trajectory is sustained. So, uh, number one, do you believe in this? Uh, and number two, everybody <coughs> that is involved in the process talks about the red lines uh, in the process. Are there any red lines for China as we move on? <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think, yes, in terms of security, China is very happy with the recent thaw of tensions between the United States and and North Korea and the improvement of South-North uh, relations. Uh, however, many in China's policy circles <coughs> have the suspicion that whether it is a question whether Kim Jong-un is very sincere in his commitment to denuclearization. So in, in a sense, China is a, a beneficiary uh, because <coughs> the bottom line of China policy toward North Korea is no conflict. And North Korea's political survival is very important to China. Another thing China is scared about is uh, denuclearization that North Korea is committed to. But there are suspicions in China uh, toward both the United States and North Korea. And I think most Chinese in political circles say that the United States, rather than North Korea, is the major source of instability. Uh, they see that uh, the United States is, is targeting at North Korea superficially, but the long-term target is not the, uh, North Korea, but China. Look at that, for instance. It is designed, uh, to, it is, the, the, the Americans say that that is directed at, uh, against North Korea. But most people, military especially in China, is, is saying, are saying that uh, that is against China. And there are even suspicions that uh, North Korea could reach a tacit understanding or some kind of agreement that the North Koreans can keep some of the nuclear devices uh, if they, they are not threatened in the United States. So the worry is that in the long run, you see a, a, a nuclear weapons kept in North Korea could be turned against China because it is closer to, the, to China. And uh, along with the improvement of uh, North Korean, US, North Korean, South Korean relationship, China might lose something. Uh, that is a worry uh, because most Chinese see the United States as a major <coughs> security threat. Uh, whether Kim Jong-un and uh, Trump will talk about China, in what way they will refer to China? Will Kim Jong-un say very good things about China uh, in his discussion with Trump? Or will Trump say very good things about China in his discussion with, with Kim Jong-un? The Chinese are very suspicious. But then also, the Americans are suspicious as well, because they don't know what Kim Jong-un and 
uh, uh, Xi Jinping talked about in their three <coughs> rounds of uh, uh, conversations uh, in, in China. And Xi Jinping may go to North Korea for an uh, a state visit uh, maybe in the next few months. So we don't know the, exactly what is happening. But one thing that is very peculiar uh, between China and North Korea is their uh, long-term ideological affinity. That ideological affinity has existed ever since the two uh, communist parties took power in the late 1940s. And lately, China sends its uh, 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 very high-ranking <coughs> official by the name of uh, Li Zhanshu to North Korea to join the celebration of North Korea's uh, establishment uh, 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 on the, their anniversary, uh, 70th, uh, uh, 70th anniversary of the establishment of the uh, DPRK. And I think the Chinese highly value the party-to-party -party relationship uh, or even uh, the top priorities, a party-to-party relationship rather than state-to-state -state relationship. So I uh, don't know whether the part, when they, the two communist parties get together, they will talk more about denuclearization of North Korea or their common grounds in resisting Americans' uh, scheme to undermine the communist party's <coughs> leadership. So this is something we have to keep in mind. And uh, as I said before, um, the, the, worst, uh, the, the worst scenario <coughs> in Chinese mindset is that <coughs> the United States may prefer to keep the nuclear threat alive so then can, they can justify uh, and uh, perpetuate US military presence in Northeast Asia and to maintain U.S. security alliances with Japan and South Korea. So uh, I, I think this kind of distrust is not a plus in uh, U.S. China relations and that, that will endure for the time being. When the U.S. China relationship is worsening as we see it today, some in Beijing are further convinced that Washington is definitely trying to take advantage of its newly establishment uh, of ties with Pyongyang at the expense of China. And finally, my point is that the official uh, position toward the North Korean nuclear issue uh, in China will remain consistent. But given the softening of attitude of the Moon government and the Trump administration toward the DPRK, China is expected to resume economic cooperation with North Korea with less constraint. So my conclusion is that the likely outcome may be North Korea's gestures of denuclearization, plus some superficial or artificial dis dismantlement of these nuclear sites. In exchange of East international sanctions, and increased foreign trade. The DPRK may win broader international recognition without sacrificing the essence of the nuclear capacity. However, if it, its demands are not satisfied, Pyongyang may again resort to the threatening of force. I hope Thank I'm you. not uh, right in, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wang. Uh, I have to remind uh, I have to remind everybody that uh, we are running slightly short in time, so I'm going to move right away to Dr. Pal, and uh, I'd like a series of interesting questions. But I'm going to just ask you a very simple question. Under the circumstances, uh, South Korea's and America's interests seem to be uh, not fully aligned, uh, at least uh, in the last few weeks. There were a lot of bickering. Uh, between uh, Seoul and, and Washington. Uh, how do you see uh, the trajectory of American and South Korean interest as we move forward in this process? Well, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for World Policy Conference and Tiaid. 
de Montréal for the invitation to be here today with my wonderful colleagues. Um, to go directly to your question, I think as I try to write the story of the last few years on the Korean Peninsula with the emergence of new leaders in North and South Korea and in China five years ago, um, it's a, and our, of course, President Trump, uh, the, the main players are all pursuing different objectives and the storylines intersect in very strange ways. Uh, just a year ago, when we talked on this subject here in, or in Marrakesh, uh, it was all about fire and fury. Um, the Trump administration had been enormously successful despite its anti-diplomatic tendencies in mounting a huge diplomatic campaign of UN Security Council sanctions and often unnoticed beyond that, tremendous cooperation to constrain North Korea's diplomatic and economic activities beyond the sanctions around the world. And maximum pressure was being put on North Korea at the end of last year. Who would have guessed we'd be here today after that? And I have to give a lot of credit to the South Korean president for his initiatives in this. Uh, he, um, there, was, there were interchanges between North and South Korea. We don't know what happened before January 1st. But on January 1st, Kim Jong-un made a speech in which he said his nuclear and missile ambitions were essentially satisfied, and he wanted to then take care of the needs of the people of, and the economy of North Korea, together with these assurances of national security through defense measures, nuclear capabilities. And the South Korean leader, uh, Moon Jae-in, was able to return to his his faction, his party's long-term interest in improving relations with North Korea, bringing down the barriers between the North and the South, and enhancing economic and other interaction with the North. And he took the initiative to, with whatever had taken place in North Korea that led to the January 1 speech of having both guns and butter, uh, he took the initiative with the Winter Olympics to get the process going. And the US, if you remember at that time, Vice President Pence arrived at the Olympics and looked kind of stunned. He didn't know what to do. We were supposed to be maximum opposed to anything with North Korea, and everybody was applauding the North Korean teams. They were happy to mix together, the and it looked very awkward for the U.S. Um, we, now, fast forward to where we are today, and we have gone from a position of absolute opposition to the continuation, the so-called comprehensive, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization of North Korea to something which in reality, that's now got a new name, but in reality is an acknowledgement that we have a new member in the club. We're not going to give them a past, but like Israel, like India, there's a new nuclear power in the world and uh, North Korea is it. Now the question is on, on what terms? Uh, what do we want them to do to um, reduce their capacity to make more weapons? whether closing Yongbyon facility down or some other facilities. I think we've gone from having very unrealistic expectations to having much more modest uh, expectations of what can be achieved through bilateral negotiations. And I think per President Trump is prepared to declare victory uh, fairly soon, maybe at this next summit, where he'll say we're satisfied that progress has been made, that threats have been reduced, our people will continue to talk about eventual denuclearization, but that's a, a distant horizon, not even a prospect, just a distant horizon. And Trump will have satisfied the American desire to keep the, Korea, the Koreas separate from China, because your Cold War strategy requires that we maintain the alliance structure, however uh, dissatisfactory the terms of the <coughs> alliance may be, and at the same time, he will have a greater ability to pressurize South Korea to take the terms that he dictates for the relationship. And this will have a knock-on effect on Japan as well, because their calculation is that South Korea and Japan do not have an alternative in the shadow of giant China to being allies of the US, but the US will be in a position to set the terms. So it, in all of this, the South Korean president has been soldiering on in his own purposes, to go back to your question, uh, to establish more and more linkages, trying not to transgress the lines drawn by the UN Security Council resolutions, but increasingly doing so. And so what we have is a situation at the end of this process where China's a big winner, as you asked Professor Wong earlier. In my view, that's true. Uh, South Korea's leader is a big winner politically. That may not be sustainable in a democracy. 
North Korea is a big winner in this. And Trump, at least for the moment, is seen by Americans as having gone from threatening fire and fury to being in a love affair with the North Korean leader. And it's actually selling with the American people that he's brought peace. So it's a four-way win out of a very messy situation. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Yim, same question. Are you diverging? Are you starting to diverge with your interests with the United States? And, uh, and generally, what's your view of the situation? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, uh, for the floor. Well, it's always a uh, great pleasure for me to be uh, at WPC and, uh, you know, uh, sitting in the prominent panel like this. Well, it's very embarrassing uh, that uh, I was preempted by my old friend, I mean, uh, you know, uh, for the presentation I, I'm going to make uh, uh, in, in this panel. Well, uh, we worked together a long time ago when uh, we had the first, I mean, North Korean nuclear crisis. Well, uh, Doug was uh, a White House official and uh, I was assigned in Washington working at the embassy. So we had to face, I mean, the first North Korean uh, crisis. But the uh, good thing is that we always, uh, you know, were on the same page. Uh, so uh, it was extremely easy uh, to work uh, with Doug, which means good, you know, cooperation between my government and the U.S. administration. Well, um, I think he, he you know, uh, well aptly he presented, I mean, the overview of what's happening, uh, you know, uh, this year and uh, what happened last year. So uh, last year, I was sitting uh, in the same panel uh, saying that uh, South Korea faced the most dangerous national security crisis since the Korean War. Well, uh, North Korea continued uh, provocation by making uh, nuclear bombs and launching long-range missiles. Well, uh, there was a dramatic turnaround, I mean, coming into the beginning of this year. Well, as uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul said, I mean, President Moon uh, utilized the, the momentum of the Winter Olympics at Pyeongchang in Korea and he induced North Korea uh, to come to the peace process on the Korean Peninsula and invited uh, uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un uh, to the summit table. So he succeeded in inducing Kim Jong-un and even succeeded in mediating uh, first ever held summit between the U.S. president and North Korean leader. So everybody was excited, I mean, to see what would happen when President Trump and uh, Kim Jong-il meet, you know, in the scheduled summit. Well, uh, we, we have seen, I mean, the, you know, uh, great fanfare and the great, I mean, you know, uh, summit which was held in Singapore and uh, as a North Korean negotiator, I had a very high expectations uh, from uh, the result of uh, the summit meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. But I was, I mean, uh, you know, uh, very shocked, I mean, to see the contents of the Singapore agreement, I mean, which was printed, I mean, uh, later. Well, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, President Trump made a misstep, uh, you know, uh, in inducing North Korea to the full and complete denuclearization. Well, uh, you know, if you look at the contents, uh, the language, I mean, they expressed in the statement is the North Korean language, not our language. Well, uh, South Korea and the United States set the goal, I mean, uh, for the denuclearization as CVID, complete, verifiable, reversible dismantlement or denuclearization. But what they said is the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. 
which has been used all the time by North Korea. Why not North Korea, but the whole Korean Peninsula, which includes South Korea? We don't have nuclear weapons. We never developed a nuclear project. But the only thing you know, uh, we have uh, in South Korea is the US nuclear protection and US nuclear umbrella. So by you know, mentioning uh, the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which means you know, uh, well, the US should withdraw the nuclear umbrella protection for South Korea. And uh, even with the you know, North Korean language, I mean, they agreed, well, uh, three points. Uh, number one was to normalize the relations between North Korea and the United States. Number two, uh, peace, peace initiative or peace regime to uh, be established on the Korean Peninsula. Number three, denuclearization. So it gave rise to the sequencing problem. North Korea will insist that U.S. must act first, I mean, to normalize or to have, uh, you know, uh, well, regular relations uh, with North Korea before North Korea moves for denuclearization. So this is the, you know, problem. I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Trump, I mean, uh, well, he never understood, or I don't know, but what happened. And, um, well, Kim Jong-un was very, uh, doing a very good job, uh, fully assisted by the institutional memory of the North Korean bureaucracy. But uh, Mr. Trump, I don't know what happened between himself and the very you know, capable bureaucrats at the State Department and the DOD. So uh, there seems to be some you know, uh, gap between the White House and uh, other bureaucratic institutions of the United States. I strongly believe, uh, I trust, I mean, the you know, uh, State Department officials and the uh, US military, and that they, I think that they will handle, I mean, this issue well uh, down the road. But now, Trump, I mean, uh, Kim Jong-un wants to have a second summit with uh, Mr. Trump. Why? Well, I think he can play around with uh, Mr. Trump, and uh, so uh, he doesn't want to have some uh, working level negotiations to resolve this issue, but he wants to get close to Mr. Trump. I mean, uh, you know, uh, well, Mr. Trump said, they are in uh, love, and uh, he likes the love letters from uh, Kim Jong-un all the time and keeps the letter in his uh, pocket. Thank you. So, well, I think uh, uh, still we have uh, impediments, obstacles, before we realize the full <coughs> denuclearization of North Korea. But we cannot go back to the uh, confrontation uh, you know, we saw last year but uh, we have to keep North Korea on the table with our leverage, which is international sanctions. We had the two leverages until last year. We had a, a strong military uh, you know, uh, combined forces between the United States and South Korea. But after the Singapore summit, Mr. Trump let it go, and the normal combined military exercises between the US forces and South Korean military. So we lost one leverage, but we still have you know, uh, another effective leverage, which is uh, international sanctions led by the United States and the uh, United uh, you know, Nations. So uh, we have to keep going until we see uh, the change of North Korea in a genuine and uh, in sincerity. Thank you. I Thank you very it. much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yim. And now uh, I'm going to go to Professor Yuichi. Uh, are you as uh, cautious and skeptical uh, in Japan? And where do you see this uh, 
trajectory going from the from Japan's perspective? Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, I also like to uh, my, my microphone. I think the microphone might not be working. May I use a microphone here? There is a. Thank you that very much. Now. Uh, microphone is on. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And also, I'd like to thank the organizer for uh, including me, or I should say, including Japan in this uh, session. Because by sitting here, I think that I can give you an impression that the Japan is not marginalized or isolated in the process of the negotiation on North Korean issues. Uh, yes, uh, I'm skeptical, but we can have some hope. But basically, I'm skeptical for some reasons. And before that, i like to clarify uh, some points regarding uh, of Japanese position uh, uh, to the North Korean issues. Uh, some news media are saying that Japan is marginalized or isolated in the process of uh, uh, North Korean issues. I think this is partly right, because Japan didn't join in the Korean War. And uh, armistice agreement of uh, uh, July 27th of uh, 1953 was signed by American forces and Chinese People's Volunteers forces and North Korean forces. Japan didn't join in that process. That's why these three powers are principal uh, parties to talk on peace talks. I mean, the United States, North Korea, and China. And the armistice agreement stipulated to start the peace talk among the four countries, United States, China, North Korea, and South Korea. So it would be natural that Japan actually doesn't join in the process of the peace negotiation. But on the other hand, I also like to say that among the all G7 summit meeting leaders, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is the most experienced leader. Uh, he uh, visited Pyongyang in September 2002, together with Prime Minister uh, Junichiro Koizumi at that time. And so that's why he joined in the process of the drafting Pyongyang uh, uh, declaration between Japan and uh, North Korea. So he knows the details about the negotiation. Also, at the time when he was a prime minister in 2006 and 2007, the six-party talks, which included Japan, actually uh, published several important statements and joint declarations. And uh, Prime Minister Abe also knows very well about the details of that negotiation and uh, agreement. That's why he knows the detail and he was betrayed twice. North Korean government betrayed Pyongyang declaration and North Korean government also uh, betrayed uh, as well, joint statement of the six party talk, which a Japanese government actually joined in. And that's why it would be natural for Japanese government to, to be spe skeptical to North Korean attitudes. So what the Prime Minister Abe or Japanese government is doing is not to isolate or contain North Korea, but to try to persuade North Koreans to come back to the original position of agreement, which North Korean government itself actually agreed and accepted. So that's why it would be uh, 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 possible to see that the Japanese position is tough. Japanese position is tough because international community actually has been retreating from the position which international community agreed in 2005, 2006, and 2008 in United Nations and also in Six Party Talk. But besides, let me end to add one point. Japan can play also a very significant role in the process of the reconstruction of North Korea. Once <coughs> rapprochement and peace talk uh, can be advanced because uh, in the Pyongyang Declaration, Japanese government agreed that once the treaty was concluded, Japan uh, will put, would provide uh, economic assistance to uh, North Korea as a kind of uh, war reparation. I mean, in 1965, at the time of the uh, 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 basic treaty between Japan and South Korea, Japan started economic assistance to South Korea. That's why Japan 
was willing to provide equal amount of economic assistance to North Korea. It means that North Korea can get huge amount of economic assistance from Japan, and this would be essential foundation for, I think, North Korea, reconstruction of North Korean economy. That's why at some point, I think that North Korea would be willing to invite Japan to join in some talk on the reconstruction of the country. Of, but if North Korea doesn't like to invite Japan uh, uh, for having economic assistance from Japan, maybe Japan can be happy because we don't have to pay it. But I think that because it is written in the Pyongyang Declaration, that's why it is quite probable that Japan will join in the process of economic construction of North Korea. But I like to end that, but I'm quite skeptical because uh, uh, I well, like uh, Ambassador uh, Im already mentioned because the international community, particularly President Trump, has been retreating from the previous agreements because President Trump has no interest in details of the negotiation and it will kill uh, the stability in the region and uh, destabilize the region. And uh, we will see perhaps a structural change in international politics, which uh, President Trump has no intention to do that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yuichi. So we now move to Professor Talaraya. And uh, you recently wrote, Professor, you, you asked yourself and the audience a question, who needs to make peace with whom in this, in this situation? And are we really talking about the new peace regime as a conclusion of this process or, or a reconfiguration of a previous arrangement? So along those lines and uh, with the question about Russia in general, Russia uh, doesn't seem to have been in the forefront of this, but Russia is a member of the Security Council uh, a permanent member, and uh, and Professor Ichi was uh, talking about perhaps Japan uh, feeling a little marginalized in this process. Is Russia marginalized in this process? And uh, and if not, uh, what are Russia's red lines in this, if any? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, uh, I've been watching Korea for more than 45 years and it has always been like a pendulum, swinging from the extreme tension to so, some kind of detente. Uh, but these days, I think that this, uh, the amplitude of this pendulum is really stunning. Uh, I actually uh, knew pretty uh, comparatively well a former leader, Kim Jong-il, and he once compared uh, his uh, negotiation with the U.S. to a chess game. Uh, I believe that the current leader, his son Kim Jong-un, prefers poker, uh, nuclear poker, and the, and the stakes are much higher uh, these days. Uh, however, now we have the most peaceful and promising period in uh, uh, the Korean uh, situation for many, many years. And if you ask myself uh, if this persists, this situation would persist, I would just get given a uh, Nobel Peace Prize to President, uh, President Moon, President Trump, and <coughs> Kim Jong-un. I don't know whether it can be divided on three, but anyway, we have now the most peaceful period, and that actually satisfies uh, almost everyone, apart from conservatives who want to uh, to push down North Korea by sanctions and pressure. Uh, so is uh, the agreements uh, on the reach in Singapore, a reach between North and South Korea, are actually feasible? They are understood as complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization of Korea in exchange for peace guarantees. Uh, the problem is that none of these, uh, uh, of these goals are attainable in the, in the first place and in the short run for sure. What is the security guarantees on the part of the United States? I don't think that maybe uh, uh, Dr. Powell wouldn't agree to me, but I don't think that uh, U.S. system 
itself gives any possibility for the future government to keep the guarantees the previous, the, the previous government had given. And we see a lot of uh, that kind of US behavior, the latest being the uh, INF Treaty, uh, when obligations and the guarantees are withdrawn or uh, reconsidered. And this is just the nature of US political system, not ill will of, of uh, this or other rule. So how in that case uh, you could expect uh, North Korea to give up its only guarantee for survival? That's the nuclear card. However, there is an answer. The answer is that the process is more important than the result in this case. As long as negotiations are going on, as long as uh, North Korea uh, face by face uh, deny, uh, declines its uh, nuclear program, missile program. Uh, uh, it uh, gives up its uh, ideas of developing new weapons. It gives up uh, the danger of proliferation. Uh, and at some, at some phase, I think that North Korea uh, would only be left with a small uh, existing nuclear arsenal just to be on the safe side. I think uh, that would be a, a situation uh, uh, which, would be, uh, which would be better than the one that we had last year. Uh, and Mr. Yim mentioned that with the constant uh, nuclear tests and missile tests and danger of big war. Um, I know that the US side have already understand uh, this kind of situation. I met with Ambassador Began uh, last week in Moscow. And uh, now they use the uh, words full, uh, no, final, fully verifiable denuclearization. And you can argue what final means. Does final denuclearization include peaceful program, for example, or not? And there is a lot of room for, uh, for negotiation and reconsidering that. Uh, so, uh, one more thing about North Korea about them cheating and breaking their obligations. One rule I have acquired uh, over years of dealing with North Koreans, uh, you should uh, understand that they will fulfill the obligations they have taken on them, not the obligations you think they have taken on them. And usually there is a misunderstanding that they must do this and that. If they hadn't agreed to that, they mustn't do and wouldn't do it. So you, you should be very objective and so far uh, I think that uh, uh, this negotiation progress should go on and on and on. And the longer it goes, uh, the better it is for both regional cooperation and the, uh, the international order as well. Of course, you can always argue that uh, North Korea keeping its uh, uh, nuclear potential for a prolonged time would deal a blow to the <coughs> non-proliferation regime. That's true. Uh, that's true, but at the same time, I don't think it will be a fatal blow. And uh, uh, in the current situation of, uh, uh, of the well, crumbling world order, interlude to some new world order, which we don't know how it will look like, and actually, if you see Russia and U.S. exchanges of uh, harsh words about nuclear containment, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to predict how the uh, situation <coughs> in the non-proliferation sphere will develop. Uh, so uh, maybe it would be better to have North Korea totally uh, give up their nuclear weapons and have the Korean Peninsula fully free of all nuclear danger. That would be better. But, you know, as Mick Jagger said, you can't always get what you want. I think what we can get now is peace process. And this peace process should be guaranteed by the political guarantees of the big powers which are involved in the Korean situation historically. I mean, Russian idea on the uh, roadmap, starting from freeze, then negotiations, then multilateral guarantees. 
And here at this place, we have the countries which should be a part of it. Uh, that's China, US, Japan, Russia, and Mongolia, because Mongolia is also a part of the Northeast Asia. Uh, so if we reach this stage, I think that uh, that would be a promising stage and it would take off tension, maybe for a prolonged period of time. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor. I, I prepared a range of questions, but we're not going to get there because I want to give a chance uh, to the audience to ask questions. So instead of all these questions, which I will have to leave for the, ne for the next time, uh, I'm going to make a very quick poll. Of, uh, of everybody here that sits at the table. Now, I'm going to ask you to give me a yes answer or a no answer, although I know uh, that it's a very complex thing. Uh, in 2028, uh, when we gather for the 21st World Policy Conference, is there going to be a single Korean state? Uh, I'm not asking you if you like it. I'm not asking you uh, why do you think it's difficult to answer this question? I'm just giving you an option to answer yes or no. Your expectation, starting with Mongolia. Is there no. going to be? No. no. China? No. US? No. South Korea? No. Japan? No. Russia? So that, well, that's a very, very, very decisive poll. And now I am going to give the chance to the audience to ask questions. Please. Sir, in the first row. Thanks. It's open. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can, sir. Um, look, my name is uh, Don Johnson, and uh, I've had a long interest in this subject as Secretary General of the OECD. Many meetings with Kim Dae Jung in particular, who, by the way, did win the Nobel Prize for the Sunshine Policy. So I'm not sure you can say that there was not progress in the past, because after the joint declaration of, of 2000, there was a period when Kaisang Park was established, uh, the Hyundai Resort was established, uh, there were investments being made by numerous, uh, <coughs> numerous uh, South Korean countries in the park. And during that period, I suggested the real problem, or one of the problems, which takes me to your idea of reconstruction, from Japan is that the economy was a black box and it remains a black box. And what's important, I think, for anybody to go in there other than mining companies and others, because there's some important minerals, is to understand the North Korean economy. Now that's going to require uh, an economic review, which was I, was I was pushing for at the time. And the Americans resisted. Finally, they came around. I got a call from uh, Christopher Hill, the State Department, the sex party talks said, look, the North Koreans now want development capital, not just humanitarian aid. And uh, they said, that will need a review. And of course, I was thinking of an OECD review, and then I was told later that the North Koreans would never accept that because of the background of, of the OECD and so on. But nonetheless, that's going to be essential, I think, you know, to follow through with you. Who's going to put capital into reconstructing North Korea without a better idea of how that economy functions? Uh, yes, you make it, and I say the mining sector resources. That's on the issue of, the, of uh, a review. The last point I would make, though, is the one that you raised, uh, Professor, just now about Tolerant. That's the issue of, um, of securitization. Uh, I read this book when I was making a speech on the 10th anniversary of the Joint Declaration uh, from Lim Dong Wan, I think it was, who was at uh, one time the Minister of Reunification, I believe. And the book was called Peacemaker, and I read the translation of it. I was very surprised to see that during the Sikh party talks, Russia has stepped forward and proposed that North Korea be made not a protectorate, but a protected state of the kind of thing you're talking about, guaranteed by the United States, guaranteed by Russia, and guaranteed by China. Uh, now, that struck me as being a very sensible approach to denuclearization. But you know, from what we've heard from everyone, they're not going to give up their nuclear weapons for at this point. And I was impressed by Lim Dong. I said, let's just get on with it. Can you get on with it? Can, can you help develop North question? Korea sorry, sorry while they still have nuclear weapons? Can we get on to the question? And separate those two issues. The Americans have never separated those two issues. So if you separate those two issues, if you have an economic review, Japan, everyone else contributes, invite investors in, 
I think that may be the way to go, but that's, you people are more experts on this than I am. Thank you. Uh, I would like to have a question from the next, uh, uh, do you have a question, sir? Yes. Okay, could you ask the question, please? Je uh, vais parler en français. Donc, je considère que ce problème de Corée du Nord est vraiment... Depends, depend, the, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, but it depends on who are you giving the question, uh, because the French might be a problem for some of the panelists here, because there is no translation at this moment. Who are you asking? Alors, je pose la question à, à, la, Corée, uh, à la Corée du Sud. Voilà. Uh, je disais tout simplement que ce problème de Corée du Nord est vraiment un, un cas d'école en matière de relations internationales, parce qu'on a tout d'abord au premier plan les États-Unis, la Corée du Sud et la Corée du Nord, et en second plan le, le Japon, la Chine, la Russie et la Mongolie. Et chacun de ces pays défend ses propres intérêts, et ça c'est normal dans les relations internationales. Alors, ma question euh, à, aux représentants de la Corée du Sud, Est-ce que vous n'avez pas plus d'intérêt à vous entendre avec la Corée du Nord pour diminuer l'influence des États-Unis Et est-ce qu est que l'idéal, bien sûr, là je rêve un petit peu, est-ce que l'idéal ne serait pas une conférence internationale regroupant à la fois les pays de premier plan, États-Unis et les deux Corées, et également Japon Chine, Russie et Mongolie pour essayer de trouver une solution à long terme. Merci. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent question uh, which South Korea always faced, I mean, you know, uh, on how to resolve the Korean Peninsula issues. I mean, as you know, uh, geopolitically, the Korean Peninsula was surrounded by big countries like, uh, you know, uh, China, Russia, and Japan, far away, the United States. So uh, we made uh, various sets of uh, countries, I mean, uh, uh, to get together to resolve the Korean issues. I mean, uh, three, uh, three countries, North and South Korea and the United States, and uh, sometimes uh, in four countries, uh, South, North, China, and the United States. And six party talks uh, we have tried, I mean, to resolve the North Korean nuclear issue. So uh, I don't think uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, the only uh, formula where we can, uh, you know, put uh, these questions and the to uh, you know uh, resolve the Korean issue. Now, uh, well, uh, the problem and the threat comes from North Korea. So uh, I think uh, you know we have to uh, have some international formula, and uh, uh, well, you know some institutions. I mean to take care of this uh, denuclearization, uh, you know, uh, problem. Uh, now. Uh, my president Moon Jae-in, uh, he he's an ideologue, and uh, you know uh, he wants to pursue inter-Korean, uh, you know, peace through uh, three countries. I mean, first, I mean, North and South, and the United States. Uh, after that, uh, we can be supported by China and Japan and Russia. So. Uh, there is no, uh, you know, fixed, I mean, uh, formula uh, for uh, doing this. But at the moment, uh, you know, what my president tries to do is to mediate between North Korea and the United States. But, well, it's a quite difficult, I mean, uh, job, uh, you know, uh, shouldered on him. Well, North Korea, uh, hasn't changed, I mean, in, in, in terms of tactics, I mean, uh, brinkmanship tactics or salami, you know, slicing tactics. Well, until we really see the change of North Korea, 
Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, it is a difficult, I mean, task for my people. <coughs> so, uh, well, we would like to see some breakthrough, I mean, uh, uh, on this issue of denuclearization. Then we have to have some other countries joining uh, to make, uh, to establish peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. China was a party to the Korean War, so China should uh, participate. And Japan is the most, I mean, uh, close neighboring country, uh, which could play some uh, role uh, at the later stage. Of course, Russia uh, should do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, ask the last question because uh, we ran out of time, but I do want to ask my friend, uh, uh, President Elba Dorj, this question. Uh, what do you expect uh, from the second summit if it happens? And it seems like it is going to happen. You know, in, uh, before the first summit, uh, I, I wrote a piece in, uh, in my uh, Twitter and said, don't rush for the summit, first summit. I think we always forget, we always talk, and we always, always charmed <coughs> by the leaders' meeting. We always forget the poor people in North Korea. You know, don't forget those poor people in North Korea. I think uh, people think that the uh, leaders, political leaders think that they can have business uh, with the North Korean leader. And uh, I, I think only from that, from the first summit, one winner, there is Kim Jong-un, North Korean dictator. He got tons of the video, he got tons of the photo opportunity. Uh, there is no control in North Korea and public relations inside sure of North Korea. Are you sure that he was the only, uh, the only winner? And, because there's a, there may be another and, winner next week in America. And, and you know, if, uh, if someone sitting from North Korea, ordinary person or who are detained in Gulag, they might say that, don't be fooled, you know? Don't be fooled with our leaders. If, if there is only one solution, if there is more continued pressure, maximum pressure on North Korea, I think there might be a solution. But there is no solution uh, when you have that meeting. I think don't forget those poor people. If there is economic assistance, I think uh, those people in a first circle, there are three circles. Kim uh, family circle, um, uh, 10,000 people, in Penyan circle and the rest of the country. The rest of the, of the country circle never gonna get that assistance. Assistance became the weapon against them. And because of that, when you meet with the, with the North Korean leader, you have to raise issues related with their human rights, with the, with, the, with the issue, the situation, how those North Korean poor people are suffering from the uh, Kim dynasty, three generations. There is no such dictatorship in the world in modern history. Uh, from the grandfather to father and to, to the grandson. And I think uh, <coughs> if, if you put issue about the North Korean people in front of the North Korean leader, I think he might kneel. If you put issue, discussing issues related with the nuke and, and sitting at equal level with the American president, he will always salvage. And don't be pulled to that. And that's, uh, that's a really bad idea. And, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really, really, really hurt by this kind of meetings and negotiations and pot offs and but uh, North Korean ordinary people not getting anything thank you. from that. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, everybody, for this. It was a fascinating discussion. Join me in the round of applause uh, for our able panelists. Thank you.